Ladies and gentlemen, Doug of Who is Second in the Building? Oh my God. I didn't realize you were a diehard Dodger fan. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm actually a Yankee fan, but I, I live in California and the rest of my family is Dodger fans. So I root for the Dodgers versus the Yankees every year, as I think it would be the biggest uh, World Series. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic, man. Uh, I'm excited because you're here and and we got the reason of closing in on a billion YouTube subs. What does that what does that mean to you that a billion people have watched that that video? Um I don't know. It's like one of those I think I think it's like one of those like new new type uh, accomplishments that uh, you didn't think about. Sorry about that. Um you know, I mean, shit. None of us thought about accomplishments or or, or milestones like that ever. You know, um, and I think it's something that's more on the on the radar of younger artists and stuff like that. Um, we got a YouTube plaque. I got a, like a plaque from YouTube uh, a while back with like a million subscribers, uh, subscribers, something like that. And my eight year old son freaked out because that like it meant more to him than to me. I'm like, okay, like. Um, whereas like the, you know, the double, triple platinum records in the wall mean absolutely nothing to him, but are more significant to me, you know? So I love that. I love that. Hell yeah. Um, I'm hanging out with my boy JB. He goes by JB music, six, six, one. He's my co-host today. Uh, JB, do you have any questions for Doug before I deep dive and all the questions I've got? Doug, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, being with us today. Really do appreciate it. Coming from uh, someone that's been listening to music for about a decade now, uh, I just want to ask you, the reason it being your biggest song, um, does it annoy you at all? Or is it one of your favorite songs you've ever like produced out? Or what's your opinion about it? Um, it, it did annoy us at one point. You know, it's like I think uh, we uh, we've been doing this for so long. Uh, we've been lucky enough to not kill each other, you know, already. Um, but I think we've just become wise. I think it only annoys you when you're in it. Uh, I feel like in your, in a certain part of your career, um, right after the success of that album in 2004 and five, uh, we went in to write our third record and it was a uh, a conscious point to avoid anything that we thought even reminded us of that song which is weird you know like because i mean it's not weird i think it's actually really common for for a musician uh, like a musician to do that um because they don't want to repeat themselves definitely um in uh so i'm glad that we did that but there was a moment that you know we our first album had, was successful and we um we were touring a lot and the perception, the, the, the public perception of the band matched the band's internal perception of themselves. Mm. You know, we, we played these shows with a lot of energy. There was mosh pits and we played with the bands that we felt were our um, contemporaries, you know, like uh, the ones that we would go see on our own. Um, so it, that continued into the second album. Uh, and then when the, the, the reason took off it got so big and it was kind of out of our control it was like a wildfire you know it's kind of a stupid mm. uh um metaphor but uh, it was completely out of control and we you know we're, we're we went from playing these shows in these theaters where it's all like these kids and 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 fans that i felt like we could relate to um uh, to playing these you know amphitheaters and, and arenas for a bunch of like 14 year old girls and their parents, you know? And while that's awesome because you're playing these huge venues, um, the song became bigger than the band, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the perception of the band to a lot of people changed, you know, that like, even though we didn't do anything, you know, like, Oh, they're that, you know, they've got that song. And so when the, when the perception of the band doesn't match 
the internal perception of the band, there's there's a little bit of a uh, a struggle. I mean, for lack of a better, a better term, and we fought it, and that's when we reg- that's when we kind of regretted that song. We were just like, dude, we don't. It's not indicative of what we do. You know, it, it's a it's a song. We didn't write it with anybody we didn't craft it to be what it was we did it the same way we did every song before and every song since um uh and so yeah we fought it for a while until we kind of realized shit um all this time has gone by and the song is still has life and uh, and um it's you know provided us you know, with so many opportunities which have uh, extended our career. Um, and so I think we're a lot older and wiser and we can kind of just accept accept it for what it is and kind of understand where our place in the musical, you know, music his- history spectrum, where it falls. Um, and that's, I think that's good. I think I, I, it's, it's a lot healthier to be where we are now uh, as a band than it is to be like fighting against your own music. It's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Can you can you describe the moment where you were when you found out you were Grammy nominated? Because I feel like that's a pinnacle of a lot of artists. Just yeah, I, it is. That's one of those things. Um, I don't know. There's been a few moments in my life where I go, dude, this isn't. This shit only happens in movies. This isn't like my life. You know, this is the kind of shit I see on TV and in, in the theaters. Um, being nominated for for a Grammy and other awards in general that that I you know used to watch on TV and stuff like that. Um, I remember my manager, our manager at the time, uh, took us for a meeting. He said, "Hey, we got to go see a meeting. It's out in like Santa Monica or something like that." And um, we go into this building and we sit in this big meeting room, big old table, the whole deal. I had no idea what the place was. I thought it maybe it was some kind of like whatever touring talk we're going to have or some kind of legal discussion, whatever. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, I guess where the, the Grammy building is. Uh, yeah. And they, they came in and they said that we were nominated for um, three Grammys and it was weird. It was a, it was a trip and it was really cool to be able to tell that to my parents, you know, that's a, that's a, was that the know, moment, was dad, that the moment that your parents were like, wow, you've, you've made it. Or did they have that moment earlier, but that was like the solidifying, wow, Doug. Uh, that definitely <laughs> was. I think that wasn't like a solidifying po- thing. Because at that point, the reason the song was huge, you know, I think at that, for, I forget what year it was, it was the most played song on planet Earth, you know, like, or some, there was some kind of stat that said it was the most played song. Um so my mom has always been super supportive, um, as early on, especially if not in words, but definitely in actions. You know, it was like, Doug, when are you going to get a real job? Uh, but then, yeah, you can borrow money to 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 go dub these demo tapes. You know, like she would be, she would always worry like a parent. My dad was a little bit more. He was an older uh, older generation, a little bit more hardcore. Didn't really get the music. Um, but, uh, I think after, you know, after, after going, Hey, you know, we, we got, we got nominated for Grammys and, and stuff like that. It, 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 um, it changed the perception, I think of, of their little kid. (laughs) What, what keeps, I mean, it's rare when a band from, from high school is still together so many years after, after being in the music scene, what advice would you give? a local band on on the form of longevity being being such such close with your with your bandmates and not having those fights that cause breakups how do you guys keep well, we it? have i've had fights but we um there's always been a good balance dan the guitar player and myself i would say are the the yin and the yang you know kind of the heart and soul of the band um I would say more head and heart, really, because I, I at times could be um, ultra logical to a fault, you know, and too reasonable. Um, and and he's all passion and fire. And I have to, like, kind of talk him off the ledge uh, where he has to 
you know, push me to the ledge to get fired up. So it's been a good balance in that sense. Like it, it, I, we need the fire, but we also need someone who could, who can direct the fire in a, in a productive manner, you know, and, and it's worked out in that sense. But I don't know. I tell my kids this, I got a couple of young kids. Um, one's, you know, 12 and nine. And I'm, I'm, I'm in no place now as a parent to ever tell my kids, Hey, you guys can't, pursue xyz for your careers you know i like yeah, i chose i didn't choose it but you know i ended up doing something that is so ridiculously rare who am i to say like oh you want to be a pro baseball player dude you're never going to be one you know i i have to go if you want to do it you have to you kind of have to put everything into it block everything out and you really have to enjoy you just have to enjoy the process you know, it's like the goal can't be the the ending can't be the goal. The goal has to be the process, you know, and and um, that's that's the deeper way of, of kind of saying, well, we always just did it for fun. You know, like some of my most the most awesome memories I have of the band are before we had a record deal or before we even played a show, you know, just like in our bass players guest house you know writing songs and, and hearing these things back for the first time and and that excitement some of the excitement i had playing our first shows ever could never be duplicated even when we played our biggest shows ever you know um and that that process is what kept me kept us coming back you know at the end of the day we're like fuck it who cares if we're not you know where we once were career-wise uh, at this point we still get to, you know, go to rehearsal and fuck around and and we joke around, you know, half the time and we get to make shit and and people still want to see it and hear it. Um, I think that's it, really. It can't be like, you know, I want to be I want to make a million dollars and I want to be nominated for this. I want to be famous. I always say and we, we had a lot of very close friends who who some went on to have amazing success and some you know, got dropped off record labels after an, an album. Um, and it's not, there's not a specific formula that's like, well, they, they didn't, they made it because of this and they didn't because of that. But I always go back to thinking like, there are so many bands out there that, or people who've gotten into music that got into it for the wrong reasons, you know, not, not like nefarious reasons, but like, I do, I want to be famous, you know, I want to be a fucking rock star and whatever that means. Um, and a lot of people make it even with those motives, but I think, I think, um, if you want to have the longevity and you want to have, um, yeah, if you want to have it never get old, then you got to be doing it cause you just like to make music and that way you get up and do it regardless of what your career looks like or doesn't look like that day. You know what I mean? I love that. Uh, I'm going to let JB ask another one here in a second. But before I do, you kind of alluded to something I wanted to ask about. You said you had more fun in some of the shows before their first record ever came out. I'd always heard a rumor that on your block, a member of Incubus and a member of Linkin Park grew up right around the corner. Is this accurate? Uh, um, pseudo accurate. Um, you, you, you live in California, you said? I do. I'm from Florida originally, but I, I live uh, in Victorville area. Okay. Um, yeah, dude, I, we are, we live in the suburbs of LA, a little bit northwest of the San Fernando Valley. Um, it's nice. Dude, we used to joke around and say it's like three car garage rock. Is what, <laughs> what we'd say. Um, Dan, our guitar player, grew up in Calabasas. Um, he went to elementary school and middle school with a handful of the guys in incubus uh, a few of them and uh i live in agora hills which is like the neighboring community and um yeah i went to school and lived down the street from brad delson and mike shinoda uh from lincoln park and uh and a high handful of other people. they're all they're all from this neighborhood i was golfing Oh, last last month with um, Aaron Bruno from AWOL Nation. Like, it's just it. Everybody kind of knew each other around here, you know. It's a talented area over um, there. It sounds like. <laughs> yes and no. It, it, 
I think it's yes. It, it, all those people I've mentioned are, are extremely talented and extremely fortunate. But I also think it's a little product of the of the music industry. You know, they 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 something hits and like blood in the water, they they swoop in and they 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 sign everything. You know, and they throw everything against the wall to see what sticks. So we might have just gotten more opportunity than some other city. Not necessarily more talented. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, our first show was, uh, in my parents' backyard. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a video. We actually have a video, like a home, like a really bad home, home video, like with the old, you know, VHS camcorder, yeah, yeah. uh, of the show and sprinkled throughout. There's a couple guys from, from Incubus. It was a house party, you know, they're just there and, um, the opening, actually, the opening band, the first band that played was Brad Delson, the guitar player from Lincoln like, Park, his first band. Um, so he's on, like, looking at this guitar and, like, making sure his fingers are in the right place, you know, and and, um, and doing stuff like that. So, yeah, so there is some truth to that, but but it, that's, that's the real story, you know. Everybody was kind of, we went to high school together, and it is what it is. Cool. Uh, JB, you're up. And then if it's okay with you, Doug, can we do some, some chat questions and some ru internet rumors? Sure. Cool. JB. So before you guys got signed with the big record deal, uh, what was the biggest, what was the band's like biggest goal? Was it to be signed or was it to play shows or what was, what was the biggest goal as a band? Um, I would say it was probably to, to be signed or make it some sort of career. You know, um, we started in 95, like started playing shows in 95. In 99, we had a like a demo deal, I think, with Mercury or something like that, where they, they paid for a handful of songs. And then if they liked them, we would have gotten a deal. Uh, we recorded three or four songs and they were crap. And they didn't they didn't they turned it down. But then we shopped it around to everybody. And we got turned down by everybody, like literally every single fucking label said no. Um, and at that point, you know, we'd been at it for four years and uh, our friends, you know, at Incubus had, had already gotten signed and were, were on their way. And uh, I don't know, we kind of, I think I remember, I can't speak for everybody going, but like, you know, prior to them, thinking like dude this is kind of a pipe dream but it happened for them and so i'm like well then why not us you know like um so in 99 we were a little bit of a crossroads um realizing that after being turned down by everybody it, it seems like it would be even harder to get a record deal you know <laughs> being here here's the same band that you guys turned down x amount of time ago now listen um we uh, we made some changes at the time. We had a couple sax players, um, and our music already was evolving to be a lot heavier than it was. Um, but I remember going, I think we need to, I think we need to make some bigger changes, and uh, we ended up letting them go, um, changing, uh, firing our manager, and kind of just taking uh, taking the band back into our own control. And we also stopped shopping the music around we we kind of said fuck the business aspect of it um which goes full circle to back what i'm talking about I'm like, Let, let's just do this because we like to play we like to play shows it's really exciting uh we love to create music let's just do that and i i feel like i just told this somebody too like i remember telling either dan or or acknowledging to myself like okay you may never this may never be a career but who fucking cares like you can have a job and still play music and have a great time. And I, I think at that point I was kind of ready to accept that. Like, okay, I might just go back to school and, and, uh, and get a, a quote unquote normal job, but I'll still be in this band and we'll still play shows, you know, on the weekends and it'll still be a lot of fun because I still wanted to do that. And I don't know if, if that mentality and shifting away from, from the business aspect had anything to do with, uh, why we eventually got signed. But after that kind of uh, shift in perspective and, and focus, I think within a year we had a deal. 
That is awesome. You, you, you're, I love, I love how elaborate your answers are, and I want to ask a hundred questions, but I'm trying to keep it a reasonable. What was, it, what was it like playing with Jeremy on that one-off show where he was back in the band playing sax just that one time? Um, but it's kind of how it all started. Well, how was that one t- one-off show? Um, I, I, I think you're talking about when we did a, a handful of years ago, right? Like, yeah, this is at least 10, 10 15 years ago. Yeah, or so. yeah. Something like that. It was cool. I still I still talk with, with Jeremy, who's the, the sax player. I mean, literally, he texted me yesterday. We're both huge Dodger fans. And he was like, what the fuck is... Who is this pitcher? Why do you... <laughs> so we still keep in touch, you know? Like, um, we're on good terms. And, and um, I remember... You know, I mean, I don't know if it was that big a deal to me at the time. Like, oh my god, we're gonna we're gonna play with with Jeremy again. But I remember we played some old songs off of our like stuff that we that we uh, released before we had a deal, and it was fun. It felt honestly like riding a bike. It felt very familiar. I think the show was the whiskey, and we used to play that place so often. Um, I love the whiskey. That uh, yeah, it was. Hell yeah, show. it was fun. Chat wants to know. Uh, y- Back in the day when you made the out of control music video and it had the stage shaking all over the place, was that difficult to shoot? Would you ever consider shooting a uh, a future music video with a similar style stage? Uh, it was a little difficult to shoot, but fun. I actually wanted. I remember telling the uh, the director was Wayne Isham, like I don't want a fake fall. If I wanted to make me fall, I want I want to struggle to stay on this thing. I wanted it to be authentic, you know. Uh, so in that sense, it was fun. They they made this huge, you know, infinity looking stage, and it had all these hydraulics under it, and there was a guy off the, off the side pressing buttons and stuff like that. Um, and I remember at the time, I think our, our guitar player Dan had a he's had a, like back issues for a long time, and his shit was fucked up, and they had a pole bolted into it and he was he's actually strapped to it so if you go back and watch the video you'll notice some of his movements look like he's kind of stuck on something and i think they might have taken the pole out and post or something like that but yeah it's because he's not the rest of us are free like on these things and if we fell off we fell off uh but he's like locked in he i think he had like a belt or a harness or something that that was covered um but i would totally do it again but i'd probably get hurt so easily we don't want that. Uh, let's do a fun one. Uh, this is the internet rumor that you guys scrapped Rihanna on Inside of You. Obviously, that's a, that's... she she wasn't as known at the time. Is there is there a chance that version ever sees the light of day? That's a true story. That's not a rumor. Um, our record label asked us to consider putting on one of their new artists because we were both on Island Def Jam at the time. Uh, like, sure. Our so- The song was already written. And uh, we sent it off to her team. They did something with it. They sang like a little kind of a pre-chorus type thing um, and sent it back to us. And... I nobody loved it. That's the the short answer is nobody really loved it. Like, um, it wasn't her. It just we kind of got our version of demoitis. You know, we were so locked into the structure of the way we've been hearing it since we wrote it and recorded it, and that's a long fucking process. Like we've been hearing it this one way for months, and now we send it off and they send it back and it sounds different. And so, and we didn't. It's not like anybody knew how enormous she was going to be. Um. Uh, so that was it. And uh, I think, I don't know if there'd be any like legal ramifications if we're like, hey, guess, here's here's Rihanna on a Hoopa Sank song. Um, Lawyers can call in right away. <laughs> I, haven't heard, I haven't heard it in years, but I do think our guitar player has a copy of it somewhere on a hard drive, like somewhere, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the labels have to clear all that stuff for sure. Legalities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I've also read a rumor that one time you were pushed out of an airplane without a parachute. No. This is completely a, I, false. I, I, I've jumped out of an airplane, but I definitely had a parachute on. Okay. The the rumor I saw said you were pushed out and uh, you did not have a parachute, but you were totally fine. I don't know where these things start. but uh. I, I, <laughs> no, Pretty fucking rad. 
Yeah, that's um, scary. That's scary here and now. I, yeah. What What do you think? The Dodgers are right around 500 right now. If you If you could make a drastic trade, uh, what would What would you do for the Dodgers? Uh, it's too early. I think. I think it's too early. It's definitely too early. Think, Let's just have a too early a too early uh, trade. A too early. Um, damn man, I don't. I don't know because it seems like one day their 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 pitching is on and they can't hit, and the next day they can hit, but their bullpen can't get anybody out. So I haven't. I feel like it hasn't really established a solid pattern yet. They need. They need uh, Tim Anderson to play shortstop. <laughs> so they should get him from the White White Sox somehow. When when you're not working on music, hanging with the band, hanging with family, aside from all those things, what what just genuinely makes you happy? Um, I oh mean, I'm pretty simple. I, but the, the thing is, you just pretty much named everything I do. It's like, you know, I'm going <laughs> to play music or I got to rehearse and hang out with those guys or I'm with my family. I coach my daughter's softball. And oh, my cool. Baseball. Very cool. I'm busy. All, it's like, I have to, I have to like, I have to coordinate band rehearsals and stuff like that around when I'm not coaching. <laughs> so. So that's like your main focus is is is, is coaching uh, for for baseball, well, which is not really cool. coaching, but family family definitely is the main focus. Now, as far as time consuming, yeah. So push pull was the most recent release, but when we started this interview in the background, I see a DAW system pulled up, which tells me you're probably working on music in the background. Can we expect yeah. new? Literally working on ideas. Excellent. That that tells me all I need to hear. So we may get some new tunes before the year's over or early 2024, safe to say. Either or, yeah, for sure. That is awesome. Hell yeah. Doug, I know you're a busy guy. I'm going to say, JB, what's a final question that you have? I'll ask one final question and then we'll let Doug go on his way. And we appreciate your time so much, brother, for real. Yeah, no problem, man. Yeah, Doug, thank you so much. Um, you brought up the whiskey. And the whiskey is a place that I was able to perform a couple times, uh, being a small, uh, smaller artist. Can we expect you back soon, or is there anything in the dates that you're able to tell uh, tell us? Or that show would sell out in ten seconds. What you mean at the whiskey? The whiskey a go go in Hollywood. I'd play there again. That's I do. We have I can't I can't count how many times we play there. Obviously, we like cut our teeth there at the Roxy and everything up up and down Sunset, but. Amazing. Um, it would be fun, and I would do it in a heartbeat for sure. It just Amazing. It, it takes a little bit more coordination now with all this coaching. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, so Doug, you you said earlier that uh, the label paid for for the the demos, and then you were able to shop around, which totally does not happen for artists nowadays. When when you have the ability to have smaller artists open up for you guys, is there a mistake that you see local bands making? It's just not in your place to be like, guys, you're doing it wrong. Is, is there something you notice local bands making a mistake in? Um, I, I wouldn't say local bands, but I think bands in general. Um, just from my own perspective, I feel like when bands, um, I don't know, sound, uh, sound like they're mimicking their, their most obvious influence, too much i think that's a mistake i know i i shit i've been there a hundred times you know especially early on and i know some people might hear that and go fucking dude this guy these hoops tank sounds like xyz i get it i i'm talking about for all my, my that's the, the one thing i could afford myself like i said with all with wisdom and age like dude i get it i understand where i fall in the in the spectrum but there are there are times when i just see bands um trying that sounds really bad just trying so hard to to either i don't know just like i said sound exactly like something or look or you know i don't know there's something about authenticity that i think is priceless and uh in in music and in your appearance and your expression of whatever you're trying to do um 
And when I see a band that's obviously inauthentic, I, I, I never go up to them and go, dude, you, no one's buying this, you know? But in my head, I'm just going, that's not going to work. That's mm. not going to work. Hell yeah. Well, well, Doug, uh, I mean, congratulations on, on it's going to happen fairly soon. The billion views on the reason. Congratulations Woo-hoo. on your success. Uh, I hope the Dodgers play the Yankees in the World Series, so maybe we can talk a little sh- to each other. But, uh, dude, right. look if forward. Happens, if it happens, hit me up again. We'll, we'll, we'll shit talk. Absolutely. It's got to it's gonna be the most watched World Series ever if that happens, by the way. But, uh, oh, for sure. Dude, we look forward to to the new the new music that you're hard at work on, and uh, thank you for doing this. You did not have to, but God bless you, sir, and uh, continued yes, success, you. of course. Ladies and Thanks, gentlemen, guys. Doug of Hell yeah! Enjoy the rest thank of your evening, sir. Thank you so much. Okay.